In the previous lecture, we sort of dipped our toes into the world of band structures of three-dimensional crystals. You know, our illustrative example was polonium, which is great from a conceptual point of view, but in real life, unless you happen to be a member of the Russian intelligence agency, you're really kind of unlikely to come across polonium anytime soon. So in this lecture, we're going to continue looking at elements from the p-block of the periodic table, elements that adopt a cubic structure, but we're going to go to elements that have a face-centered cubic Brave lattice, and in the process, we're going to look at some representative metals and semiconductors. And we'll also learn a little bit about why certain elements are metals while others are semiconductors. So as a starting point, we need to consider what our first Brillouin zone looks like. And so this image shows the first Brillouin zone for a face-centered cubic Brave lattice. And so right away, you're going to say, hey, that looks a lot more complicated than our simple cubic lattice. What's going on here? And the reason why this looks more complicated, because this Brillouin zone corresponds to the primitive unit cell of an FCC Brave lattice. So here I show the cubic centered unit cell, which has four atoms per unit cell. And then the dark lines show the rhombus that is the primitive unit cell. And remember that this rhombus has edges that are all the same length and then angles between those edges that are 60 degrees. Because we use that rhombus, the primitive unit cell, as our real space unit cell, that helps to explain why the first Brillouin zone in our reciprocal space lattice looks so much more complicated. If we look at this shape for a minute, you might recognize that it's actually a truncated octahedron. And, you know, one piece of knowledge that's almost a bit of trivia, but might be worth knowing, is that a face-centered cubic real space lattice has a body-centered cubic reciprocal space lattice. There are special points here in our first Brillouin zone. The coordinates of some of those are listed below. I don't want to dwell too much on them. I will just say that gamma is, as always, a special point for us. This is 0, 0, 0, right at the center of the first Brillouin zone. And then notice that the L point is the FCC equivalent of the R point in a primitive cubic lattice, because the coordinates are one half of each of the three reciprocal space lattice vectors. So we're going to see this change in the phase as we go from one unit cell to the next in any direction in the real space lattice. If we're talking about elements that have a face-centered cubic Brave lattice, they don't get any simpler than a cubic close-packed metal. And so let's look at the band structure of aluminum, which has a cubic close-packed metallic structure. In the primitive cell, there's only one aluminum atom, and that means that we have only four bands in our band structure. A 3s band, and then contributions from each of the three p orbitals. Now, just as we've seen in a couple of examples prior to this, when we go to the gamma point, we see a large separation between the S band and the P bands. And these bands here are orthogonal to each other. So I've drawn the crystal orbital that corresponds to the 3S band at the gamma point, and you can see um, all of the interactions are in phase, they're bonding. If we were to look at the whole structure, we would see that there's 12 aluminum atoms around each central aluminum atom, and all 12 of those interactions would be bonding. And so that gives us this crystal orbital, which is the lowest energy crystal orbital in the entire electronic structure. Uh, the p orbitals, on the other hand, you could choose to draw them in different ways. Here, I've drawn them parallel to the long axis of the rhombohedral unit cell. But the point being that because the p orbital has this nodal plane and changes phase from one side to the other, 
when you're at the gamma point, there's going to be an anti-bonding interaction between the p orbitals. And so we see all three p orbitals are degenerate at gamma, and this interaction is anti-bonding. This is the highest energy crystal orbital in the first Brewan zone. Now, when we move to other places in the first Brewan zone, to these other special points and the lines between them, then we can have sp mixing. And what we end up getting are crystal orbitals that are somewhere in between these two extremes. We're not going to dwell on the details of this band structure. I think the main takeaway points are four bands, because we have only one atom per unit cell. We have quite wide bands. I mean, the band structure here is encompassing about 24, 25 electron volts from top to bottom. And because aluminum has only three valence electrons, we're only able to fill these bands up three-eighths or 37.5% of the way. So our Fermi level is cutting through these very wide bands. And that's a recipe for delocalized electronic conductivity. Now let's go on to the diamond polymorph of carbon. Right, we've already looked at the band structure of a graphene, which is the two-dimensional equivalent of graphite, and the band structure of graphite is in fact quite similar to that of graphene with a few subtle differences. What happens when we go to the sp3 form of carbon, the diamond structure? We still have a face-centered cubic lattice, uh, as shown here, and you can see that we still have carbon atoms at the corners of the unit cell and on each face of the unit cell, just like aluminum. But now we've got carbon atoms inside the unit cell, and there are four carbon atoms inside the unit cell at the center of alternating octants of the unit cell. So there's a total of eight carbon atoms per unit cell. Now that's the centered unit cell. If we were to look at the primitive unit cell, which is four times smaller, we would find that there are two carbon atoms per primitive unit cell. When we look at the band structure of diamond and compare it to aluminum that we just looked at, here's a couple of quick takeaway points. Because we have two atoms per unit cell, now we're going to have double the number of bands. So we have eight bands. The lower set of bands are made from the bonding MOs between the two carbons within the unit cell. And just like aluminum, at gamma, the S and the P orbitals don't mix. Now, if you were to look at this lower set of bands here, you would probably recognize that those look a lot like the bands we had in aluminum. We have a completely bonding crystal orbital at gamma, whose orbital character is carbon 2S. And then we have a crystal orbital made up of carbon 2p states, which is much higher in energy because it is largely antibonding. Now, one distinction here when we say that we have antibonding interactions within the bonding MO band, what are we talking about? Let's look at this picture. Notice that we can um, choose the interaction so that the two atom motif of the unit cell is bonding but that does not make the interactions of this two-atom basis set with the two-atom basis set in neighboring unit cells bonding. So we may have one bonding interaction, but we also have anti-bonding interactions to carbons in neighboring unit cells. And so this state, we're calling it gamma p. That's not to say it's all bonding or anti-bonding, but a bit of a mixture of both. Then we get four more bands, and the difference here is those come from an anti-bonding combination of the two atom basis set here. And so there's an anti-bonding S band, and then we have three anti-bonding P bands. Now let's consider the filling of these bands. Each carbon atom has four valence electrons. There are two atoms per unit cell, so we have a total of eight valence electrons to fill up these bands, and that's enough to fill four bands. And we're going to fill these bottom four bands. Then we have a gap of 5.5 electron volts between the next four bands, which are empty. The nomenclature used in semiconductors is to say that these filled states that are mostly bonding in character are the valence band, and these empty states, which are mostly anti-bonding in character, are the conduction bands. The gap between the two here is 5.5 electron volts, 
which is a pretty substantial gap. And so normally we would think of diamond as being an insulator. It's also true that the highest energy crystal orbital in the valence band here at gamma is at a different K point than the lowest energy crystal orbital of the conduction bands, which is over here somewhere between gamma and X. So diamond is an indirect band gap semiconductor. What happens when we move down the elements in group 14? So you might know that the elements immediately below carbon, silicon and germanium, also crystallize with the diamond structure. We can see here that the bonds get longer as we move down the periodic table. That's expected. We can also see that the band gap is decreased pretty substantially. So silicon and germanium, which have band gaps around one electron volt, are really ideally suited for many kinds of electronic devices. And silicon is, without question, one of the most important elements for technology in the modern computer age. If we were to go to tin, tin is actually polymorphic, but gray tin also takes the diamond structure. The bonds get longer still, and the band gap now is only a tenth of an electron volt. So tin is, is practically a semi-metal because the gap ha has almost gone away. Tin also has another polymorph, white tin. Its tetragonal structure is, is, and its properties are much closer to that of a metal than they are to a semiconductor. And of course, if we were to keep going to lead, well, as you all know, lead is not a semiconductor. Lead is a metal. It has a close pack structure. So what's responsible for this transformation from insulator at the top of group 14 to semiconductors for silicon, germanium, and to some extent tin, and then finally metallic behavior as we get to the bottom of group 14. And, and in fact, this behavior is not unique to group 14. We see this transformation from insulating to semiconducting to metallic across much of the P block of the periodic table. So how can we understand this from a bonding point of view? Well, let's look at the band structures of silicon and germanium. Qualitatively, these band structures are very similar to that of diamond. And in fact, they're both indirect band gap semiconductors with a valence band maximum at gamma and a conduction band minimum at another point in the Brillouin zone. The main thing I want you to take away is to look at the energy of this S star band at gamma. So this is the crystal orbital that's formed from the antibonding combination of two S orbitals in the basis at the gamma point. So remember that it was quite a bit higher than the antibonding P band in carbon. Now when we come to silicon, it's still higher than the antibonding P bands, but not by very much. By the time we get to germanium, it's dropped well below the antibonding P bands and is quite close now to the top of the valence band. And if we were to show the band structure of tin, the gap would have almost disappeared. So what's really going on here is as we increase the bond distance and therefore decrease the orbital overlap between these valence shell S orbitals, the bonding states are becoming a little bit less bonding, and the antibonding states are becoming substantially less antibonding. That's causing the gap between these antibonding bands and the bonding bands to get smaller. When we go to lead, this S star band actually drops well below the bonding P states, if we were to calculate it with a diamond-like structure. And so now we're filling up antibonding states before we've completed filling our bonding states. And that totally destabilizes the tetrahedral coordination of the diamond structure, and we don't see semiconducting behavior anymore. The bottom line that's driving this crossover from insulator to semiconductor to metal is the decrease in orbital overlap, which gives us high-lying antibonding states and low-lying bonding states. And as that goes away, actually this whole 
low coordination number covalent bonding arrangement becomes less stable. 